And we are in a series in the book of Mark, and we're in chapter 9 today, so if you've got a Bible and you want to turn there with me, we're talking about the story of Jesus healing uh, this demon-possessed boy. Um, and this is, uh, this is an incredible story. I love this story. It's in both um, Matthew and Mark, and I didn't cover this when we went through the book of Matthew last year, but we are going over it today. Um, you know, we live in a challenge-everything world, and what I mean by that is Everything that you could possibly challenge, you can find somebody who's willing to challenge it. Even the most basic, observable realities in our world today are challenged by somebody. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Did you know that the Flat Earth Society has 90,000 followers on Facebook? Uh, some of them, you probably, some of them, okay, we, we don't need to know about it. And I was listening to uh, the physicist Neil deGrasse Tyson talking to a flat earther and trying to reason with him and talking about how, uh, like, when he's looking out in the ocean and he sees ships coming in and you can see the, the change in the horizon. And it was just like, whoosh, like, right, like, I'm like, come on, man. You know, I mean, another thing that people dispute is, like, was the moon landing real or not? And listen, I don't raise your hand if that's you. I don't want to know. I actually watched a film expert, and he was like, listen, in today's world, with today's technology and all the CGI and all the special effects stuff that we have now, it would cost more than it would cost to go to the actual moon to make that film today with what we have. Now, back when they actually landed on the moon, it would have been impossible with what they had to recreate this thing again, just right over people's head because people want to believe what they want to believe and they want to doubt and question everything and you know what sometimes we make unbelief a modern problem like we think of that as like a modern issue but the truth is that every generation since the beginning of mankind has wrestled with doubt and unbelief and it's easy to laugh at unbelief and something that can be scientifically proven but when it comes to to the supernatural, when it comes to the existence and the working of God, we require faith as human beings. And that is a real issue and a real challenge. And it's the reason that the church exists today because there are so many people that, that are living in this state of unbelief and they need to know what it means to place their faith in Christ. We know that as believers, we're supposed to be confident in our faith, right? The Apostle Paul says, I have confidence in this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And that's great for Paul, but what about me? Right? And I'm Paul too, I know. But you can say that as well. What about me? My life might be a mess right now. And maybe you don't have confidence in God about anything in your life right now. Listen, I believe that if we're all honest this morning, we all wrestle with doubts. Okay, we all struggle with skepticism, with unbelief. And then additionally, there are people in our lives that, that we're trying to convince of the truth, that we're trying to point to the reality of who God is, and we're trying to tell them the truth about who Jesus is and what he's done for them, and they refuse to believe. They're, they're doubters, they're skeptics. So how do we point them to a God that loves them when they don't believe that he's real? There are lots of different kinds of doubts, too. There's doubt in the existence of God. There's doubt in the divinity of Jesus. There's doubt that, that God wants anything to do with me, that he's just out there somewhere, that he's a being that's just kind of observing from a distance. There's doubt that he has any, any ability to change anything in my life. There's doubt that the Bible is real. And there's doubt that, that, um, there's, that it's anything more than just a history book or a collection of wise teachings. Right? All of those things are doubts that people face in our world today. Uh, Pastor Tony Evans uses this illustration to talk about faith. He says that in life, you're going to come to a valley or a river or something that you're unable to cross on your own. A challenge in your life that is going to create an obstacle for you. And faith is the gift that God gives us that spans that obstacle. It's the bridge that gets us to the other side. And here's why unbelief is so dangerous. Unbelief will leave you stuck 
at that obstacle for the rest of your life. And we're going to read a story today about, about people wrestling with unbelief and about how Jesus helped them overcome their unbelief. And that's in Mark chapter 9. And we're going to start in verse 14. And I'm going to just read through it. And then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be a believer, to have faith in Christ. Uh, Mark 9 verse 14, it says, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, the scribes arguing with them. And immediately, all of the crowd, when they saw him, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. Okay, just to give you a little bit of backstory of what's going on here, since we didn't touch on this, um, we finished last week and Josh preached on um, some of the traditions and the wrestling with the religious leaders. And, and then after that all happened, Jesus and a few of his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John, went up to the Mount of Transfiguration. And there God revealed himself to them in a really unique way. And they saw Moses and Elijah and all this happened. And then they come down from the mountain after this amazing experience, after seeing God. And this is where people are like, oh, there you guys are. And they all gather around him and surround him. And verse 16 says, and he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him. Now, I, I picture this as the disciples just all kind of being like this because they're embarrassed at this point. Like, and you'll see why in just a moment. Right? They didn't answer. But somebody from the crowd shouts out, answers him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he is a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams, and he grinds his teeth, and he becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Now, before we get into the rest of this, I want to just clear up a few things. First of all, um, some people believe that, uh, that what was happening here was a medical seizure, that it didn't really have anything to do with the demon at all, and they denied the existence of spiritual enemy, and they deny the existence of demons, and that's the stance that they, they choose to live on. And then um, there's other people at the complete end of the spectrum that thinks that everything that possibly goes wrong physically or medically or emotionally or spiritually is the result of demon possession. And, and neither one of those things are true, right? There are both actual medical illnesses and, and sometimes those things affect seizures, but demon possession is an absolutely real thing. And just because we don't necessarily encounter it on a daily basis or, or see it maybe even as much in our culture as, as maybe in other parts of the world, that doesn't change the fact that it is a reality, that it is present in our world today, and that it is something that we as Christians need to know how to address and deal with. And so if you're thinking that Jesus was just confused and he thought it was a demon, but it was really a medical issue, um, I, I think I've got news for you. Jesus is not that dumb, okay? Can we just start with that premise? If you disagree with me, fine. But I believe that to be true, that Jesus is encountering a real spiritual demonic force that's possessed this boy and that he's identified that and, and that they were aware of that at that time. So it says, whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams and he grinds his teeth, becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able and he answered them, O oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy. And he fell on the ground and he rolled around, foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It's often cast him into the fire, into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, and I want you to hear this. I believe, help my unbelief. We're going to come back to that, okay? Uh, just, just put a pin in that statement and remember that because we're going to come back there. And when Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out 
and convulsing him terribly, it came out. And the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them said, he's dead. Well, that would put a damper on the situation, right? But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we cast it out? And he said to them, this kind can only be driven out by anything, or this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. I want to just share a few things about about this here. Uh, First of all, um, I want to talk about unbelief this morning. And I believe that unbelief is a dangerous thing, that our world wrestles with unbelief and skepticism and doubt, and faith is the answer to the problems that they have. Faith is the answer to the problems that they're facing. Just like Jesus was the answer for this boy's issues, Jesus is the answer for our problems. And it's our faith in him that, that is the gateway or the bridge, the extension of his grace to us. So the first thing I want us to recognize is that everyone has doubts. And, and maybe this is a difficult thing to admit for you. Um, I don't necessarily like to talk about my doubts. I rather would just come across as being confident about everything. I, I, I kind of have this, this philosophy that if you sound like you're right and you sound confident, people will just believe what you have to say for the most part. And you know what? There's some reality to that. There's some truth to that. But if we're truly being honest with ourselves, all of us wrestle with doubts. And whether we speak with conviction or not, that could completely be a facade. That could be a, a complete lie to what's really going on inside our hearts. And I think part of the problem is we talk about this confidence that we're supposed to have in our faith, and we know that we're supposed to have it this way, and so then when somebody is wrestling with a doubt, they are like, man, everybody else believes so strongly, but I'm wrestling with this. I'm the only one that doesn't believe. No, you're not, okay? Just look around the room at the people next to you, in front of you, and behind you. They all wrestle with the same doubts. I promise you that. They all question that same thing. That, That doesn't mean that we can't have confidence in our faith, and that we can't have confidence in our Savior. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's normal and it's natural to wrestle with those doubts. As it relates to God's existence, and it relates to who Jesus is, God gives us evidence, not proof. Right? We can't conclusively um, say that this happened because we have this record and this record and this, and everything happens exactly as a perfect equation. Faith isn't a blind leap, but it is a step of faith. It is, there is an element of unknown in that process. Now, God gives us lots of evidence. He gives us lots of evidence for his existence. Um, in fact, there's so much evidence for the existence of God. I wish I had time to talk about all of the different things that, that point to the existence of God and that point to the reality of Jesus and who he is and what he did and what he said. Uh, but we, we can't do that this morning. We don't have time. There's too much there. Maybe another day, maybe another message. Um, the disciples had mountains of evidence. They'd been walking with Jesus. We're in chapter 9, and they'd seen a lot of miracles to this point. They'd seen God do some incredible things, and yet they're still wrestling with unbelief. If they being as close to Jesus as they were and having that much of a relationship with him and seeing and experiencing this firsthand still had doubts and unbelief, isn't it a reality that we're probably going to wrestle with that too? That we're going to have doubts. It's not wrong to be confident in what you believe, but it's arrogant to think that you'll never have a doubt. Faith is not the absence of doubt. It's the ability to overcome it. Write that down. That's good. Okay. (laughs) Faith isn't the absence of doubt. It's the ability to overcome it. And God has given us faith. It's a gift. Hebrews 11.1 says this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. What do you need assurance for if you're just, if you already know everything, right? It's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Some translations say not yet seen, right? 
because one day we will see. One day we will have conclusive evidence. We will have everything that we need to know that what we believed is true. But in this moment, it requires faith. So how do we get faith? Well, Scripture gives us an answer for that too. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Well, you got to hear the word of Christ to have faith. How do you hear the word of Christ? Well, there's a couple different ways. One of them is to open your Bible. You, you know that little black thing that's in the chair pockets in front of you? Or maybe that's, it's on your shelf at home collecting dust or, or sitting in the corner of your room. If you don't open it, if you don't read it, if you don't know it, it's not going to do you any good. Now, I know that sounds obvious. But we are in an era in our world, we have unprecedented access to the scriptures. I mean, people literally gave their lives so that we could have access to God's word. People were martyred by church leaders who were trying to produce the Bible uh, for, for the average Christian, for people to be able to read it and know it and understand it. You have access not only to Many, many translations of Scripture, you also have access to amazing Bible study tools and teaching and information. Uh, Listen, if you don't like my message this morning, you can go online and listen to 10 more this morning from, from pastors that are better communicators than I am. Listen, there is no excuse for us to be biblically illiterate. And if we want to have faith, if we want to believe, if we want to have confidence in who God is and what he's doing, then we need to get in the word of God. And it needs to start there. The other thing is we can hear from God because he speaks to us personally. And you know what's required to hear God's voice? It starts with listening. In our small group this this past week, uh, we talked about this very issue. We talked about Samuel. And, and maybe you, you, your group did the same thing. We talked about the experience of Samuel hearing God's voice for the first time and how he didn't know what it was at first. He thought it was Eli, who was the priest at the time, that was talking to him. And he didn't recognize God's voice. But uh, he kept hearing over and over again. And eventually, Eli said, hey, that's the Lord speaking to you. Right? For us to hear God's voice, we need to take time to listen to him. We do that through prayer. Prayer is not just you telling God everything that you want and creating a list of expectations that you have for him. It's two-way communication, right? It's not only sharing your heart with God and, and, and being honest with him and asking and presenting your quest, requests to God, which is all biblical and it's all good and it's all wonderful. But if we never take time to listen, I think we're missing the greatest part of prayer because what God speaks to us is probably more important than what we speak to God. Just a thought, just something to, to, to put in your head. That's the word of God, right? Now, we're not infallible, right? So we can use scripture as a guideline to determine whether or not what we're hearing from the Lord is, is accurate. And, and we should run it through that filter because we're not perfect and we don't hear perfectly. But we sh- also shouldn't shut out the word of the Lord when he speaks to us. That's what builds up our faith in our heart. And we need to be listening to his voice. So start with scripture, listen to his voice. That will increase your faith because everyone has doubts. Here's the second thing. God is patient with our doubts. Now, it might seem at first glance from this story that Jesus is a little bit unpatient, impatient would be the proper word, with his disciples, with their unbelief in this moment. But I don't believe that to be the case. Uh, First of all, because Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, and because Jesus was full of the Spirit, it's not possible for him to be impatient, okay? Uh, He has patience. That's who he is. But also, what he says here is a rebuke, but it's, it's not meant to be harsh. It's not meant to tear them down. It's meant to get them to think. It's meant to to bring awareness. Here's what he says in verse 19. We already read this. And he answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring them to me. I don't think Jesus is mocking or shaming his disciples here. I think he's challenging them. He's telling them, listen, guys, I'm only going to be here for a little bit longer. You got me for another year. You better learn how to do this stuff, right? This is going to be your responsibility, and you need to step up to the plate. And it's, it's, like, a, it's like a 
coach talk at halftime. Uh, the other day I was ref in a basketball game. And we, we were right next to the other team's locker room. And this team should have been winning. And they were losing at halftime by 20 points. I'm telling you what, I've, I've not heard somebody yell at that volume in a very long time. I mean, I can't believe he could still speak after his halftime talk. And he was trying to fire his team up. He wasn't trying to tell them that they were worthless or that they were garbage. He didn't want them to come out depressed or defeated. He wanted them to rise up and to do better in the second half, right? And Jesus is challenging his disciples. He's pushing them. He's encouraging them. And and what he's saying might have a little bit of an edge to it, but that's what they needed to hear at that moment. Now, here's where the counterexample comes. Look how gentle he is with the father, of this boy, right? He asks him what's going on. The father explains it. He rebukes the disciples. And then what does he say to the father? How long has this been happening? Did he need to say that? Did he need to ask that question? He could have just healed him, right? But Jesus shows that he actually cares by saying that. He's asking questions. He wants to hear the history. He wants to hear the story. Because he cares about this father. And when the father asks, like, what am I supposed to do here? Jesus had compassion on him. God is patient with our doubts because patient is part of his nature. It's part of his character. He has to be patient with you. It's who he is. Right? So even if you're a knucklehead, any knuckleheads in here? You don't have to raise your hand. I appreciate it. You're with me. I'm one for sure. Okay? Right? Here's the third thing. We grow in confidence as we experience God. Okay, so faith comes from hearing the word, right? We've established that. Confidence comes from experience. Philippians 1.6 says this, I'm sure of this, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. I'm sure of this. I'm confident of this, right? That's, that's what Paul is saying. Why? Because he had experience of it in his own life. He's talking to the Philippian church. He's saying, I'm confident that God is going to finish what he started in you. You know why? Because he did it in me. He took me from being a Christian murderer, right? Pursuing Christians all around the world to kill them, to becoming the greatest missionary this world has ever seen, planting churches all around the world, moving the cause of Christ forward. He's like, I saw it in my life, and because I saw him do it for me, I know he can do it for you. That's the confidence that we can have. Now, this is why maturity is so important. One of the things that that I've learned that as I grow in my faith, the disappointments that I experience... Don't rattle me like they used to, right? It's not as dramatic as it maybe was when I was a new believer, when I was first experiencing these things. It's like the the highs and the lows level out a little bit. There's a little bit more consistency in my life. Now, you probably heard the saying before, trust is earned, right? Anybody heard that before? Trust is earned. Now, there's some truth to that, yes, but in order for you to earn trust, trust, don't you have to be given a little bit of trust first? Right? Like, if you never have the opportunity to earn any trust, you can't. And so it's, it's not entirely true. There has to be some level of trust given before it can be proven. And that's the same thing with our relationship with God. How can God prove himself to you if you don't give him a little bit of trust? And give him an opportunity to do that, to prove who he is. Now, I've found this to be true, that every time I've given God the opportunity to prove himself in my life, he has. He's been faithful every single time. It hasn't always worked out the way that I wanted it to in every situation. But that's not speaking about God's faithfulness. That's speaking about my need for growth, right? And, and maturity is learning to, to differentiate between those two things. That just because you don't get what you want in any instance doesn't mean that God isn't being faithful. 
Faith is, is giving God a chance. Faith is, is trusting him enough to giving him the opportunity to prove himself. Confidence is what comes from giving God that chance because he always does prove himself faithful. So demonstrate your faith. This is the last one. Demonstrate your faith by confessing what you believe. This is the best part of the story right here. It says, Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. So he's asking Jesus, hey, is it possible? Can you heal my son? Jesus is like, yeah. <laughs> Hello? Of course I can. All things are possible for the one who believes. It says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help my unbelief. Now, that might seem like a conflicting statement. All right, because he's saying, I believe, but help my unbelief. Those are two different things. You know, this isn't just... This isn't just uh, a call to name it and claim it, okay? Uh, maybe you've heard that terminology before. This isn't a way of manipulating God, of getting what you want to get. God is not your magical genie, all right? This isn't a mantra. This isn't something that if you just say it enough, you'll become it. No. When you confess something unbiblical and outside the will of God, it will only disillusion you. But if you confess the truth of Scripture and the will of God, there's power in that. When we confess what we believe, we're giving legs to our faith. We're taking action steps. We're galvanizing what we believe. That's why Paul says confession is part of the salvation process. Did you know that? Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, with your mouth. That means you actually have to speak it. Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. What this really comes down to is if you really believe it in your heart, you're going to speak about it. You're going to share it. It's going to come out of you too. You can't keep it inside of you. Uh, Jeremiah talked about the word of God like a fire in his bones that he couldn't shut up. Right? That's what our faith should be for us. It's not just knowing it. Real faith moves us to say something about it. Now here's the power of this story. Three words, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. I want to ask a question. What miraculous work do you want God to do in your life? What riverbank are you stuck at without a bridge to cross? Because I know this is a difficult word, but your unbelief can leave you stuck. And listen, that's not what God wants for you, and that's not what I want for you, and that's not what your church family wants for you. The story tells us how to overcome that. It teaches us to confess what we believe and then to ask God to help us for what we are struggling to believe. So here's what we're going to do as we close this morning. If you're facing a situation that you need God's help with, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to acknowledge that and publicly because that's what confession is, right? It's, it's something that's public. And, and listen, there's no need to feel embarrassed about needing God's help for something. In, in fact, if you're in a situation right now where it's like, I, I can't think of something that I need God to do supernaturally for me, that just means that you're like between rivers, Okay, you're going to get to a riverbank eventually. You might not be at one right at this moment in your life, but you're going to need God's help eventually. So this is nothing to be ashamed about or embarrassed about. But you need God to do something in your life. And listen, if it's a godly thing, if it's a biblical thing, 
if it fits according to his will and his purpose and his word, then we can be bold about asking for it. And we can ask God to intervene and to create a bridge where we don't see a way across. There's power in faith. And if we're struggling with unbelief, let's do exactly what this father did. And I guarantee you he would do it again every single time because his son was healed as a result. Let's confess what we believe and let's ask for help with what we're struggling to believe. Maybe you're going through a situation right now where your family's struggling or maybe you have a friend that needs to know the Lord and they're just being stubborn, right? Maybe it's a financial difficulty. Maybe it's a sickness or an illness. Whatever your river is, whatever the thing is that's in front of you, our God is able to make a way. And he says all things are possible for those who believe. So if that's you this morning, I'm going to ask you to, as we stand and as we worship together, that you would get out of your seat and just come up front here. And listen, we're going to believe and we're going to pray. We're going to confess what we believe about God, about who he is. And then we're going to ask him to help us with what we're not ready to confess yet. So I'm going to ask that we stand in this place and I'm going to pray. And if that's you and you're facing a river in front of you, would you just come? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made a way for us. We thank you that the ability to believe that faith is a gift from you. And so, Lord, if we're wrestling this morning or with doubts or struggles or fears, and we're at the riverbank of a situation that we're, we're not sure how we're going to get across. We place our faith in Jesus. And our hope is in him. So we stand together as a church on behalf of all of these needs. We say, God, move in power in each situation. In Jesus' name. If that's you, would you just come?